Hello and welcome back uh, today, or this afternoon rather. Uh, you've got myself and also Megan. Uh, we might start off with a couple of introductions of who we actually are, so you know who you're listening to this afternoon. So Megan, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do with SANS and what you do uh, full-time outside of SANS as well? Yeah, sure. So uh, currently I'm working as a senior security engineer at IBM, working a lot on detection engineering type content. Um, but with SANS, I do a lot around cloud, digital forensics, and incident response, kind of similar to the topics we'll be talking about today. Um, I co-authored for 509 with Josh and uh, a couple of our colleagues, and I recently started teaching that course. So basically anything and everything, cloud forensics, uh, blog posts, webcasts, that's a lot of what I do for SANS. Nice. And for myself, I work as the director for the managed detection and response team at Uptix, who uh, who essentially basically looking at cloud and also and then similar to Megan, I also uh, co-author the 509 class, our cloud forensics class. So between the both of us, we're often talking a lot about cloud together, along with Dave and Pierre, who are also our other co-authors who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but hopefully they're, they're, they're back in Texas, I think, sort of work, working hard so. and, and looking at new content and, and new research as well. So uh, I guess to start off with, let's start with a bit of a poll. Like one thing I guess we want to know is a little bit about what types of clouds people actually use. Yeah, there's there's so many. Uh, in our course, for 509, we focus on the SaaS, major SaaS providers, Google Workspace, Microsoft 365, and then we dive into the three major cloud providers, Google, Amazon, Azure. Uh, and we don't touch on the others, but there is Oracle, Alibaba, so many options. Um, so we're going to just pull the audience and kind of see what people are using. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to us to find out what people actually use. The other thing I kind of find interesting is, particularly when we're teaching the class, that what people use changes in what region you're actually in. Yeah. Like what we see, I am from over in Australia, so I'm often teaching the Asia Pac region is very, very different to what I see when we're teaching out here in the US as well. Yeah, and, and also multi-cloud is becoming yeah. more of a concept. You use Azure for your AD provider, and then you use AWS for hosting some servers. And so then it, that complexity starts too, is people need to know. And that's why I think regardless of if you are an AWS or an Amazon customer, yeah. uh, Azure customer, it is valuable to learn about all the major clouds because even if you change companies, it's a coin toss what they'll be using. That's right, that's right. And, and I mean, you're exactly right. Like talking to a lot of our students in class, it is multi-cloud in terms of what they're actually using nowadays. Yeah, and it looks like in terms of our, our audience responses, AWS up top, that's kind of what I'd expect. Yeah. I'm actually uh, quite surprised Google Cloud outdid Azure, I think, in terms of what we see from our students, or at least what, uh, you're in yeah. APAC region. In the U.S., I typically see a mix of AWS, Azure being the common ones. Google Cloud is definitely the one that's probably least used of the three. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I still see a lot of Google Cloud, particularly with people who are in the education space. Like, that's huge, yeah. whether it's universities or schools are heavily using Google Cloud or Google Workspace predominantly. Yeah. And I think that's their marketing. They they yeah. realized that they could go over them uh, with their Chromebooks. They were kind of already in that education market. So industry, region, all of those things play a huge impact. And so that's why it's important to kind of have an understanding overall of all of them so that yeah. you can adapt. Uh, prices change. People decide to switch from AWS to Azure to save money. People left Azure for AWS because Azure ran out of resources yeah, yeah. in the recent history. Yeah. So. Or some new kind of crazy service that's available in some other cloud yep. that people want to utilize. So they start to kind exactly. of pipe their information through that cloud and then back to their own. Yep. It's kind of wild in terms of what we see. Which I guess kind of like circles us around a little bit to, I guess what we wanted to talk about today, which is a little bit about threat hunting in the cloud and then also a bit of detection engineering in the cloud as well. Like being able to do things like threat hunting in the cloud, I like I don't think threat hunting is a new concept that's been discussed for a long, long time. Yeah. But when it comes to things like how do we translate the threat hunting we used to do on-prem to our services or resources or the, the crazy new widget thing that we're using inside of AWS or Google Cloud, like how do people actually do threat hunting in that space? Absolutely, and I think it's kind of that same aspect of I think in terms of proactive versus reactive, we do see a lot of people as new technologies emerge, it is the case. We see people more on the reactive side. They didn't know what they had to prepare for. And so 
talking about threat hunting, detection, it hasn't been as much touched on in the cloud because we've been so focused on here are all the attacks that are happening. How can we respond to them and stuff? That's right. And I mean, like, even if we go back to, I guess, the, the fundamentals of threat hunting to start with, like, the concept of threat hunting is where you, you go hunting in places where you don't have detection. So I guess sort of a, an interesting place for people to start is to go, all right, well, we have coverage in, in this space, so let's go threat hunting in these areas that we don't necessarily have, have sort of detections in. But I guess what we're going to talk about in a little bit, like detection inside the cloud is often pretty minimal in terms of what people are actually looking yeah. at. Yeah, so we have a broad threat hunting landscape in the yeah. cloud. There's a lot you can unbury. There's a lot of different type of attacks. I think actually one thing to talk about um, before we kind of go to the water cloud topic is ever since the cloud started, we've seen a rise in popularity of containers yeah. because the clouds make it easier and more uh, useful, more use cases for spinning up these containers. Um, so I think, why don't we touch on that really quick? Yeah. I know you're you're very focused on containers yeah, right yeah, now. Research <laughs> into container security, day five of the course, we talk about that and you've done a lot of research for it. Yeah. So like, how do you think specific to containers, what are some of the key things to think about with threat hunting? What kinds of things can we kept threat hunt for? What are the like important evidence sources? I, I think the big challenge with threat hunting, particularly when it comes to containers, is a lot of times when you want to threat hunt, you want to look backwards in time. Or you want to sort of say, all right, we've got this theory around what a threat actor might have done. Let's actually go looking for evidence of that theory that we've produced as part of it. I think the big challenge with containers is looking for that historical evidence is usually that first roadblock that anyone really yeah. hits. Because containers, the big thing in general, is even in investigations, incident yeah. response, containers are meant to destroy themselves. That's they're right. there and then they're not. And yeah. so if you come across an incident that affected a container that has already been destroyed, you're just out of luck. That's so right. that's like where threat hunting becomes much more of an important a concept with containers because you have to be proactive in searching for that evidence because yeah. you might not be able to be reactive. That's right. And even, even simple things, like if you take a really kind of basic threat hunt, which which doesn't often occur too much in reality in, in on-prem, yeah. is where you might go, all right, well, we know this IP address is malicious. Like, if you just start with something super simple, like this IP address is malicious, I want to know if a container communicated with that. It's kind of going, all right, well, what, what evidence do we have sitting around that will actually show us that? Like, can we look inside of a container that existed for the last 90 days? Probably not, based if you're just kind of using simple logging that's available. Yeah. And then also going, all right, well, what other kind of creative log sources potentially exist as part of that? Like, do I have flow logs that potentially show me those types of things? Exactly. And that's where it comes into importance. Uh, we'll actually talk about tomorrow. Yeah. Me and Josh are presenting at RSA. That's the main reason we're here. Uh, 1 p.m. tomorrow, local time. We're actually talking about how we collect that evidence, how we preserve it, how we make sure that if an incident comes or if we want to threat hunt, we have that evidence readily available to us. There's some stuff enabled by default, but there's a lot that's not. That's right. It also depends on when you set up your tenant as to whether it is enabled by default or not, too, yeah. which is just wild like when you think about it. Yeah, in the course, we have to be like, well, if you set up your tenant before October 1st, 2018, <laughs> yeah. then you're missing all these logs. Yeah. But if you didn't after, you're good. It's default now. So things like that change, you have to be on top of it. You have yeah. to know what your gaps are, fill those gaps, and consistently monitor because new sources pop up, the configuration settings change, which is unfortunate, but it's the nature of it. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's um, let's try and jump to another survey, I think, um, just to kind of get them back in order. We have the threat hunting survey to find out what people are doing with threat hunting. So do you conduct threat hunting in the cloud? It looks like we've got uh, about 40 people, 40% 40 rather, not 40 people, who are saying they are doing it. And then it's a bit of a split between people that are trying to do it or they're planning to do it or they've not kind of considered it yet too. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed. I definitely thought it would lean to more towards we're not. Obviously, 60% yeah. on the not side, but yeah. not too far off, 40% of people doing it. Um, so that's really great. Yeah. Uh, it'd be curious, uh, like, is it things, are people doing it because they had a threat hunting process in place? I think that is where yeah. you're going to see most of those things. We were threat hunting on-prem. We added cloud sources. We have these processes. It's definitely uh, probably more on the other side. People aren't doing threat hunting at all. It's more of a niche uh, uh, 
process. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So if you have a team of three analysts monitoring your entire SOC, yeah. they probably are spending all their time reactive, responding to the alerts coming in from EDR. They're not saying they're like, oh, let's go see what we can find today. Yeah. So I think that really affects it. Your your technological capabilities, but also your staffing capabilities, their skill set, things like that, um, yeah. which is probably where we see this difference of are you doing it in the cloud? Probably a good chunk of that depends on are you doing it on all. That's right. I, well, I guess maybe that's a good starting point. Like if people aren't doing threat hunting in the cloud, like you can pretty much go, all right, the threat hunting we are doing on prem, like how can we translate that to the cloud? And that kind of will lead people, I guess, to start with and go, all right, do we have evidence sources to do that type of threat hunting? Exactly. Like, like do we have the ability to, to look at who spun up new virtual machines in the cloud? If we've already got that ability on prem inside of the virtual environments on prem, how do we get that information from the cloud as well? Yeah, and it, it, it goes back to this concept in general that a lot of what we do on prem is what we need to do in the cloud. It's not a whole new skill set, all new technologies and processes and procedures. We can think about it of what are we doing on prem and what are we losing out on in our cloud environment because we were focused on on prem. And then there's mappings you can do. There's things you can do that are analogous uh, and and relevant. Yeah, and I guess people need to remember that. Threat actors don't really care whether they're attacking an on-prem environment or it's yeah. a cloud environment. Like, for, at the end of the day, for them, they're just going after whatever they can get into, basically. And and we, as the defenders, we're the ones who actually have to like be able to deal with on-prem in the cloud, or whether it's containers, which are very ephemeral in the cloud, <laughs> like yeah. disappear after a short period of time. Yeah, when I was doing a webcast a couple of weeks ago about kind of cloud detection, the question came up is. Is it APTs attacking the cloud now? Like they're moving forward and advancing. Yeah. Is it the script kiddies? I'm like, it's all of it. Yeah, it's, yeah. That's it, right. Exactly the same people are attacking on prem. They're now like, oh, and they have a cloud server that's unsecure. I might as well hit that. So right. it's it's not the threat landscape isn't changing in the sense of the motives and uh, of the attackers. Yeah, yeah. Their motives are the same. They want to make money. They want to steal uh, intel, intel like, uh, uh, yeah, proprietary files. They're still doing that. Yeah. So like you said, they don't care if you store your files on OneDrive or if you store them on a local host. That's exactly right. But, but also, I think from the perspective of our side, like I, I did a case a, uh, a little while ago where it was, again, like an exchange server sitting in AWS on an EC2 instance, right? So just a virtual machine up in AWS. The threat actors ended up hitting that with, uh, I think it was like proxy shell, essentially, that they were using. But the threat actor at the end of the day, they don't go, oh, this is a, this is an AWS environment, let's hit that. They just go after the, the service or whatever it is that they can get into. But I guess from our side, as defenders and investigators, like people need to realize that there are new techniques and faster ways to do analysis in the cloud. So in that particular case, like we could do things like snapshot and then start to look at those at, at that sort of drive really, really fast. Whereas if you were on prem, you'd have to potentially like snapshot that and slowly try to get that out of the, the environment. Yeah, exactly. The the threat actors like they kind of have to learn the new technology, yeah. but mostly they're they don't care. But as defenders, we can't always take the exact same procedures. Or if we do, it's potentially ineffective. Like, we might as well leverage the resources and things yeah. that the clouds are giving us, the services. Yeah, and to, and to make our lives faster and smoother as well. Yeah. Like, I guess there, like, there are, I guess, some characters that we do see specifically abuse the cloud when it comes to things like crypto mining, which is a, yeah. a, a hot topic. If you, I, th I think uh, Google's horizons report which they yep. are starting to release more regularly now like one of the hot topics out of there is always crypto mining exactly but that, get, that's been there since the beginning because uh we saw when cloud first started people were moving to the cloud without understanding how to yeah. defend the cloud so we just had all these open ec2 instances I I, api keys being leaked on github because we the technology almost moved faster and, you know we don't focus on security with yeah. evolving technology. We're like, hey, there's this cool new thing we can do. But it's like, okay, well, but how is that going to compromise our environment? So it was, oh, look, there's these open hosts. We can just deploy crypto miners. It yeah. became the good thing. So I think the other one in Horizon Reports that's been up and coming, I've heard um, uh, one of our uh, instructors, Leonard, uh, not Leonard, uh, Corsten, he just, uh, he just posted a blog post talking about 
ransomware in the cloud, yeah. but ransomware being data extortion. Yeah. And who, right after he posted that, Google's Horizon report came out. And yeah. I said the same thing. We're, we're not seeing ransomware in the cloud, but we're seeing people take these buckets of information. All of your data is stored in, let's say, S3 buckets. Yeah. Delete all that data, steal it, delete it, and say, yeah, you can have it back if you pay us. Yeah. So we're also seeing things like that, where it's like traditional ransomware moving to the cloud, but in a new form yeah. almost. And, and much faster, too. Like, I'm, I know in cases that I've worked where there'll be that, that extortion type activity. The threat actor is basically sucking out as much detail as they can yeah. out of the environment. And that might occur overnight. And then the next day, people come back to work and they're like, man, the internet's super slow. Yeah. What's Like, what's going on here? And they're like, oh, man, we've got, like, this huge outflow of traffic. But when it's in the cloud or in OneDrive or SharePoint or in, in Google Drive, yep. like, that is fast. And also, yep. it doesn't impact. Like, you don't kind of wake up the next morning and go, oh, man, Google Drive's really slow. That, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. So you find out when the threat actor comes back and goes, oh, by the way, we've taken X number of hundreds of gigabytes of data from your environment. Now pay us some Bitcoin as part of it. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. So I guess, um, like we've talked a little bit about, I guess, all these different services. Let's take a look, little bit of a, a look at what people understand from a logging perspective, I guess. So uh, we might throw up our, our next survey there, which is around um, understanding how confident you are that you've got evidence or log sources available in the cloud. Uh, so about half are saying that uh, they're not sure at all. All right. Well, those 50% of people, 1 p.m. tomorrow, yeah. if you're at RSA, we will tell you if yeah. you're collecting your evidence and log sources. And, and it is a real challenge. And it's the number of types of logs. Yeah. It's the difference between enable, disable. And then you get complex. Yeah, our reaction is, oh, on, 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 on. But it's not feasible from a business perspective to bring in to every it. single one. Yeah. It's the same reason on a premise, most companies don't do full PCAP yeah. and like storage yeah. because you can't it's store every space. bit of network yeah. data. And so that's another complex perspective is, hey, we want to threat hunt. We need logs. What logs are going to provide the most value? Yeah, that's right. And, and also understanding, like what we're going to talk about tomorrow is we're going to go through AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, M365, <laughs> Google Workspace. I think about the space of about 45 minutes. So it'll be a, a little bit of a rapid fire of trying to impart information with people. Um, that will also be recorded as well. So I think people can watch that back afterwards. But you're exactly right. Like understanding not only what logs to turn on, but what logs are useful to you as well. Like if you've got, as I kind of mentioned before, if you've got multi-cloud environments where you have Azure Active Directory for authentication, then you're using AWS as well for some of your hosted services, understanding what logs exist where and what logs are important as well. Like if you've got Azure Active Directory, you will need those auth logs to tell you what potentially is going on with systems over on the AWS side of things as well. Yeah, and, and then like we expand it to especially those multi-cloud things, yeah. How do we effectively search the logs? Uh, do we use the in-cloud tools? Well, I could use like CloudTrail and, and use search cloud logs there in AWS, but now we got a multi-tenant environment. We're using AD with Azure, so I'm going to log into Azure and go to the AD logs. Yeah. There's all the resource logs, all the separate applications. Uh, so then we got to start thinking about, okay, is there a place we can centralize it, a way that we can more easily search through logs, getting to normalization. Yeah. That's another thing. Uh, that was a big deal of like SIMs. As SIM technology grows, the fact you can normalize and you can search source IP instead of source underscore IP, source CIP, source IP, host IP. IP, host IP. IP. And so we have the same thing in the cloud. Azure might call it a resource. Uh, AWS might call it something different. And so it just varies all, all the time. And so that's like another challenge to approach with threat hunting. Do you know what fields you can search on? And the types of fields. We're used yeah. to Windows and Linux. Oh, you can process, parent process, those kinds of things, files, directories. But do you know about operation types? Yeah. Do you know about resource types? Do you know that crypto mining uses GPU-enabled hosts typically, yeah. so you have to send it. Do you even know what a GPU-enabled host yeah. is? And so it's it, there's a lot of intricacies of how is this data represented in each platform? Yeah. And then also, like, leading on from that, I guess it comes to things like, how do you then naturally do detections across those logs? Like, exactly. Like, once you've got those logs collected somewhere, 
how can you write detections or do detection engineering across those as well? And I think I want to say it's kind of harder than threat, threat hunting. From the perspective of threat hunting, it's annoying, but I can log into this tool and that tool and that tool and run my searches yep. individually. And again, it's, it's, it's kind of like a pro proactive search. Detection engineering, I have to know where to detect what things. I have to be extra proactive. It's not going to be detected if the detection's not in place. So how can I detect it? Where can I detect it? What are the possible bypasses? How are the threat actors going to get around this detection? Yeah. And then also, how do I go tuning those detections as well? Like, it's, it's interesting to understand that from a cloud perspective, a lot of detections often kind of run in a certain order as well, as opposed to someone kind of creating an API key for regular things. But someone creates a, an API key, and then all of a sudden it gets used from another location, then it spins up a bunch of like virtual machines. You're like, all right, we've got a potential issue here as opposed to someone just creating an API key. So, exactly. So, and that goes back to the, you can't, uh, we were talking about this earlier, you can't, Brett Hunt, you, you can't take a security perspective to cloud, you yeah. know, do cloud security unless you understand the attacker perspective. That's right. And that is something that differs. We talk about, oh, there's concepts that you can take from on-prem to the cloud, but there are attacks that are different. There's there. ways where it appears in the logs are different, the attack chains. So unless you're understanding the chain and how the attackers are doing it and how that's represented in the logs, what visibility you have, Detection becomes a major challenge because, yeah, if you don't know what to detect on, how are you going to do detection? That's right. And then also, like, patching the logs, not just from the cloud, but also from the host together. Like, if you see someone start to spin up a bunch of EC2 instances, like, you want to know what's going on inside those. Like, are they dropping yep. coin miners, which is pretty common nowadays? But are they dropping other things like DDoS tools or other C2 tools that are going to be used for later stages of an attack as well? Like, that's this other challenge, which I think a lot of people just haven't fully grasped, but particularly when it comes to detection engineering, going, right, let's patch the cloud logs and the host logs together and try to actually tell a story about what's going on. Yeah, and it, it also ties back, and I think we talk about this a bit tomorrow, we talk about in the course, is this concept of data plane and control plane. Yeah. And we get our data plane, by, control <laughs> plane, we get our control plane yeah. by default, um, but the data plane is disabled by default, and yeah. that tells you more of the micro actions taken. Exactly. So instead of just an EC2 instance was spin, spun up, like what's happening with those instances and what are happening with the different resources? If you don't have that, it's so much harder. Yeah, like of how do you differentiate a sysadmin spinning up a VM if all you know is that a VM was spun up? That's right. But I guess like it's not all it's not all bad stories, I guess. <laughs> We should also say there are good sides to this too. Like the, the side of doing network detection and logging is hugely beneficial when it comes to the cloud. Like being able to do things like turn on flow logs is yeah. simple. Like that's a flick of a couple yeah. of switches. Like it's, it's amazing. It's not, let me go beg my network engineering yeah. team to do yeah. a one month long project yeah. in which they assess taps and other yeah. network devices and rebuild the architecture and the downtime we need yeah. to set it all up. Uh, it, it allows security to so much quickly respond yeah. and seamlessly. That's right. Like it's, it's not a matter of kind of going, all right, we need to do a network outage. Please give us a network outage. Do we yeah. stall a tap to actually go and do flow logs? And even when we talk about things like full packet capture, which from an investigator, like I would love full packet capture for a lot of things, but trying to turn that on in on-prem, like that is not simple, Absolutely. let alone the outage to capture it to start oh. with, but then the location to actually capture it and the size and data that you've got to hold as the part destination, of it. Yes. the tools, getting those files to the people who need them. Yeah, it's so, it is wild. So yeah, there was, there's a LinkedIn yeah. user, uh, user in the chat saying like, the complexity level seems exponential versus on-prem. And it does, but yeah. uh, like we said, there's also benefits. There are ways we can we get more advantages uh, with the logging too. Uh, On-prem, you've got to set up a logging server that's going to yeah. store all those logs. Are we giving it the right throughput? Are we giving the network the right throughput? Are we giving the server enough storage? If our resources in the cloud are dynamically scaling, yeah. like you're getting paid for it, yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> but that's if your drive runs out of space, it's not like, oh no, what do we delete? Yeah. How do we requisition the hard drive, etc.? It's oh, the drive's full. Automatically, here's a new drive to, right. to fill to. So there's. Yes, the complexity level, there's a lot to learn. I think partially that complexity level 
comes from the newness of the cloud. Correct. Yeah. People don't understand it yet. We've had a very long time having Windows hosts in That's our right. network environments. We understand a Windows host to an extent. From yeah, and we're that very familiar with it as yeah. well. All right, let's take a look at our last survey before we wrap it up here and see what people said. This was around uh, detection side of things. So um, are you leveraging detection capabilities in the cloud? Uh, looks like we haven't had a lot of responses to this one. I think it's only recently gone up. So, um, But we can see a couple of people are using built-in tools, which is a brilliant way to do that. Yeah. A lot of the clouds are, are heavily investing in the detection tools. And that actually ties into the whole... Yes, there's extra challenges, but the, yes, there's extra solutions. These vendors are competing for business, yeah. um, and either cheap or free, they'll give you ways to detect, ways to search the logs, things like that, um, to try and earn your business. Like, we give you all the visibility. So it goes back to that's another benefit is you can use these cloud-provided vendors. The complexity comes with multi-cloud tenancy right, again. Right. How do you make sure that in Azure you're detecting things the same way that you are for AWS. Yeah, that's right. All right, well, I think we'll start to wrap it up here. So thank you very much for joining, Megan. Yep, thank you so much. Uh, if you're at RSA, 1 p.m. tomorrow, we'll be speaking about very similar topics. If yeah. you're not at RSA, come meet us at yeah. uh, one of our classes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thank you very much from Megan and myself, Josh Lemon. Uh, we hope to see you around at RSA or hopefully tomorrow at our talk at 1 p.m.